Hello and welcome back to the Goodness Lover Show. Today we're joined by Dr. Emran Mayer, who is a medical doctor, a gastroenterologist, a best-selling author of his book, The Mind Gut Connection, and he is a prolific writer. He has written over 385 peer-reviewed papers, and he has just come out with his new book, The Gut Immune Connection. We're going to be talking all about how our gut health plays into our immune system and how to best eat for our gut health. Let's get into it. Dr. Emmerin Mayer, it is wonderful to be with you today to talk all about the gut immune connection. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. Look forward <laughs> to the conversation. Awesome. So when I originally asked you to be part of our series, The Gut Brain uh, Solution, I actually had a very hard time figuring out how to write your bio because I could only put in a couple of characters <laughs> and you have, you've done so many things. So you're, you're a medical doctor, you're a gastroenterologist, you're a professor, you're a best-selling author. I, I, you just let us know that you have actually written what was it? 385 peer reviewed articles, which is low key insane. <laughs> That's amazing. And, uh, and on top of that, which Matt was nerding out about, you're also a mountaineer and all, all, all of these amazing things. So, um, thank you for joining us. It is honestly an honor to have you. And, um, we're excited to t talk about a bit about your new book, the, the gut immune connection. So before we get into that, I would love to hear a bit more about you. What led you to get into gut health? What was a catalyst for your academic endeavor in this area? Um, well, it it started with an interest in, in really in uh, mind-body or brain-body interactions. That's what got me into medical school. Um, and um, I pursued that. I initially did my um, uh, dissertation on on brain heart interactions spent several years working on that topic but then i did a a, a rotation um, a student rotation at the mass general hospital in boston in gastroenterology so this is like you know the the mecca of um, of medicine in the u.s and um, that experience really convinced me that the patients with gastroenterological diseases or disorders are much closer to what I'm interested in, you know, how the mind influences the gut and vice versa. And so to the big chagrin of my uh, thesis advisor who said I'm making a huge mistake in my career, giving up cardiology, I uh, entered gastroenterology and, you know, went through the different stages, um, um, procedures, endoscopies, uh, sort of traditional, but I've never really lost my interest in in this brain gut interaction. So it's it's been a pretty consistent thread throughout my entire career. And I'm I'm sort of proud of it that I didn't give up because in the beginning of that, there was zero interest either of my colleagues who thought I'm crazy looking at the brain as a gastroenterologist, or of patients who at the time resented the, the idea that this that their problems might be psychological in nature. Um, um, so it, it, it was a pretty lonely part the first two decades of my career, you know, the, uh, and so I'm, I'm glad I stuck with it. And it's particularly exciting now to see this um, explosion of interest in this topic. Mm -hmm. mm. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your contribution to to that part of science. And um, even though it wasn't taken up by your colleagues straight away, um, it's certainly very popular now. Um, you but just casually mentioned two decades. I know, two decades. Two decades I in the wilderness, you know, <laughs> you out there just doing, I just had all these imagery of you in the mountains studying and yeah, this, putting all this, this together. Goes back to, yeah, this goes back to the persistence you need as a uh, uh, mountaineer you know not not giving up so <laughs> <laughs> ain't no mountain high enough that's awesome just yeah plodding through so oh, i'd love to talk about the gut immune connection uh i we discussed a little bit before the call that when people think about their immune systems they're thinking vitamin c they're thinking eating their oranges but very few think people are thinking about the health of their gut. So can you tell us a little bit about it? How is the gut microbiome connected to our immune health? 
So the, the main uh, fact here is that, you know, about 70% of our immune cells are located in the gut or migrate through the gut on, on their, you know, developmental cycle. And so immune cells that reach the brain or the heart or, you know, the liver, uh, they have had a contact, um, they have been in the gut and they have been influenced by factors in the gut that are primarily on the one side, the you know the microbes that can interact with them, and but I should also mention the brain as well because the brain sends down signals to the gut as well and um, can modulate the function. So they, these immune cells are influenced by these two factors from the environment: one from the external environment through our stress level and emotions; the other one um, through through diet um, and and uh, and the microbes and. You know, equally interesting, so it's not just that the majority of the system is in the gut, but also that it's only microns away from, um, that, that the immune cells are only micro, uh, microbes away, microns away from um, from from these trillions of um, of microbes. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing engineering um, feature that evolution came up with which is an extremely dangerous situation, you know, that, that you would um, expose a system that's so sensitive to microbial, um, to, both to good and bad influences from the, from the, from the, from the microbes. So you have it placed so closely together. And the only way this, that this works is that the microbes have a big influence on the barrier that separates um, them from our immune cells. And, and I think it boils down to many of the factors um, that have to do with gut health, immune health, really boil down to the fact that, um, that the, the microbes are in this unique position to regulate the, the thickness of, you know, initially the mucus layer that um, they participate in, in generating because they send signals to specialized cells in the gut that produce the mucus, but then also once this mu mucus layer is compromised, the um, the effect of this immune activation on the epithelial cell layer, which can be become more permeable. Um, and once that happens, then you have a situation that there's direct communication between components of the microbes, the cell wall membranes, getting into the bloodstream um, and you know interacting with this toll-like receptors that are everywhere, in, including the brain, and induce immune activation at distant sites. Uh, so it, it starts there in, in the gut in a very, um, initially would seem like a very innocuous event that just this mucus layer is thinning um, because of our diet and what effect this has on, on, on the microbes. And then leading to this avalanche, um, which I believe him put out put forward, for, forward in this book that um, it, it is the main cause for our current uh, chronic disease epidemic, chronic non-infectious disease epidemic. So we're so, so much influenced now and so much programmed about the pandemic, but you know, under the surface, we have this epidemic of chronic diseases that probably humankind has never experienced before. From, from, from obesity, metabolic syndrome, colon cancer, um, um, neurodegenerative disorders, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease. I, I sort of hate as a scientist to make this, this sort of generalizable hypothesis. We're always skeptical when somebody says something like this. But I have to say, you know, from based on the research, I, I didn't think this through. It seems to be just as straightforward as this, you know, that there is a fairly, almost like the string theory of, of our immune system. Could you take us down, uh, I guess, um, an example of one of those diseases that maybe that you've studied the most as to how the gut, it, it just seems so distant to some of these diseases that it somehow connects. Could you just take us and explain the connections there? Yeah, so as I said, the common denominator is 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 the, is the immune system and the immune cells that play, um, you know, play a role in all these diseases. So, like twenty years ago, I still remember this. Um, we knew that um, if you take anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs, 
for example, um, that, that is, is a good thing for preventing um, polyps and, and colon cancer, it decreases your risk. So it wasn't really clear by what mechanism it is. Similar with the heart, you know, uh, when you take aspirin, millions of people take aspirin, um, why would an anti-inflammatory uh, molecule or drug uh, have, have this protective effect? And um, I, I, I'm not aware that this has been shown for some of the others in terms of, um, um, you, know, you know, with these anti-inflammatory drugs, but there is now emerging evidence from all these different specialties that um, a, a very similar process. I mean, the details obviously of the immune system are extremely complicated. Like when I say immune activation, it's 50 different cell types, you know, which have been characterized with all their pathways. And, uh, but ultimately the immune system, just like the way we understand now, all complex systems are, um, are not individual cells, but systems interacting with each other. And the end result is um, the effect that they have on, on, on the organ. Uh, so one, um, um, let me just think about an, an, an example that would, I mean, I should also emphasize, you know, this does not happen just with the immune activation. So the microbes also generate other metabolites, like neuroactive metabolites or um, substances that um, work together in synergy with these with these immune cells. So you have not just you know the immune influence, but you have a combination of um, like neuroactive substances, uh, molecules that are similar to neurotransmitters, um, which can have a positive effect or a negative effect. Bile acids, for example, from the gut that the microbes modify that interact with immune cells. So you have, um, you know, even, even an example, so this, you would, you would never think about this. So it's been done in, in, in animals, um, a, a stroke model. So, uh, you know, uh, um, the, in this, in the stroke model, the injury to the brain from this occlusion of a blood vessel to the brain is influenced by the microbes. So if you, um, if you suppress the microbial response to that injury at the brain level, there will be less injury, uh, the, the lesion will be less pronounced, you know, without this input of the microbes than, 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 than with it. So wow. virtually everything that happens in the body um, is influenced through these, through these immune signals that go, you know, to every corner of, of, of your body. Um, that's fascinating. Just so you, you stroke, had this question that stroke example is amazing. Yeah, no, that that's an amazing one. Um, but I think the cardiovascular system is 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 equally interesting. You know that you have this um, inflammation in your coronary blood vessels that develops, um, and which is influenced from from immune mediators that come from 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 your gut. You know, in addition to other molecules that. Are produced as a substance called TMAO, um, which has been shown to be a, a risk factor for coronary artery disease, which acts in concert with the inflammation. So it's 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 kind of a whole new understanding of chronic diseases. You know that you have. I mean, I I sort of like to see this as an interaction of the immune influence, this low grade immune activation. Um, the genetic vulnerability, so not everybody, you know, who has like metabolic syndrome and um, this phenomenon called metabolic endotoxemia, where you have inflammation in your blood. Um, but people that have the vulnerability, family history for Alzheimer's disease, they will be particularly prone to develop this. And then the third arm are these other microbial substances that so you have three areas that interact with each other. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, you know, it's good. like you can't say to this person, you eat unhealthy and therefore your, your risk, so you're gonna get Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's always this combinatorial thing that we, like, you know, systems biology, systems medicine really has that concept. It's no longer one cause, it's, it's just multiple factors interact. Interesting. Mm. Very interesting. Um, for those listening, Dr. Emerin, they might be thinking, 
Okay, I'm confused. I thought the immune system was a good thing. How come it's associated with so many bad things? Could you could you tell us a little bit how the immune system can go awry and contribute to all these uh, morbidities? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, obviously, the immune system is a is a warning system. You could almost compare it. It's an it's an ancient form of a stress response system. It monitors the cells in the in the lining of the gut. Um, the dendritic cells that have these little extensions into the gut that monitor, um, you know, what kind of bacteria there. And the minute a a bad one, a pathogen appears, they ring the alarm bells, and you know, you get systemic inflammation. Um, so this whole system works perfectly as long as you have maintained that barrier between the microbes on the one side and the immune system on the other side, and. There's a pretty elaborate regulation of that layer. There's many microbes that contribute to the integrity of, of that barrier. Uh, and then you have like the, the lining of the gut, which has these very tight um, tight junctions that absolutely prevent anything going through. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an engineering feat, the way this was came up in evolution. Um, what evolution did not foresee, it's really interesting, is that humans would go on a diet um, and would be exposed to to chemicals in their environment that would damage the microbes, the microbiome, enough to overcome that that, mechan that protective mechanism. Um, so, and then all of a sudden, you know, um, these these microbes that get close to these sensors now all of a sudden they activate these sensors because the sensors are um, set to a sensitivity level that any uh, cell wall component of a microbe is something that shouldn't be there so when even when they see a good bacteria um, and this comes in contact with these sensors then they will um, they will ring the alarm bell and they will um, send out cytokines on the other side of the, the this this barrier, and then it sets off this cascade. The cytokines will weaken the the tight junctions between these cells lining the gut, and then all of a sudden, intact bacteria can get through. Um, and the immune activation happens primarily. It's not because the microbes produce some substance that stimulates the immune cells. It's it's the cell wall component, these you know, proteins that make up the cell wall, that interact with these specialized receptors, these toll-like receptors. And um, whenever that happens, then that triggers the whole cascade of uh, cytokine production, cytokines travel through the body, um, can cross the blood-brain barrier, can change the blood-brain barrier permeability. So you have so the two barriers that normally separate us from the gut is one, the, is the is this this layer in in the gut, and the second one is the blood-brain barrier, and both are compromised when there is these cytokines um, reaching them. And wow. So what can someone do about this? Is there a certain lifestyle or way to eat that can help promote a healthy gut? You know, one of the main things is really to change our diet and. Um, Again, a fairly simple recommendation, a largely plant-based diet. If you do it for religious or spiritual reasons, you know, being vegan is is as good, even though the health numbers do not look as good as for a, a largely plant-based diet with some fish in it. <clears throat> um, but it's also not as many studies. Um, so, that's a relatively easy recommendation. And I, I think despite all the, you know, the, the annual or semi-annual um, uh, publicity around the new fat diet, <clears throat> um, I, I think microbiome science is clearly established this now. If you, if, if you determine your diet based on what's best for your microbial diversity <clears throat> and richness, that will automatically be ideal for your own health, your gut health for sure. And from what we talked about, this close link with the immune system for your overall health. And there's, there's many cross-sectional epidemiological studies that support this. And there's now a slowly growing number of interventional studies where people 
you know, like randomized controlled trials, where it's been shown that there is uh, that this kind of a diet will affect positively the microbes, their metabolites, um, the immune system activation, and clinical outcomes. So I, I think um, there's a few exceptions. You know, the keto diet is obviously a good thing if you have if you have a child with uh, intractable uh, epilepsy. This diet seems to be the only thing that really works. Um, there's some you know, some questions about does the keto diet work for advanced stage of cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease? Um, but in in almost all disease areas from Parkinson's to Alzheimer to uh, fatty liver, colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, this largely, um, this, this microbiome targeted diet seems to be health promoting. Kind of remarkable you know it, it almost would seem that like, again coming back to evolution i mean this is the diet that we really have optimized that our systems are optimized for mm. and you would say what aspect of that diet particularly are we you know if you look back in our history what, what are the type of foods and the type is it the type of foraging um is it a whole combination of factors that has led to that yeah, so the, the two, if you go back in our evolution, you know, we, we never had food that with high, with this high uh, caloric density that we have today. Um, our ancestors had to uh, live primarily from, uh, you know, foraging plants and um, um, many plants and leaves and tubers with very low caloric density and a lot of uh, high fiber content. So they in 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 order to get the calories that they needed you know to run or to migrate from the african savanna into in, into europe um they needed a lot more calories than than you know freely available calories were available in these foods so the system developed that the microbes specialized in breaking down the fiber um and generating absorbable metabolites like many of these short chain fatty acids so our ancestors um satisfied their their dietary needs or their caloric needs to to a significant percentage from these microbial fiber digestive uh, products um, and so the, I, I think that's probably the main reason why this system developed uh, and this has obviously changed dramatically today because today or in the last 50 75 years uh, in 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 Western commercial food production, we have put every effort into taking the fiber out of food and making it the white rice and the the white bread and the you know the Wonder Bread and all these things that that they no longer have a, a gram of fiber in it. And um, so these foods have a very high caloric density, and they're being absorbed immediately after you ingest them in the small intestine. So we starving or we have been starving our um, microbial partners in, in, in this, that before we, we were, you know, relying on them. So now we're starving them. And I, I think that the collateral damage from the situation are our chronic diseases. Um, part of this started, um, so you, you can actually look at evolution. So the size of the colon where this main fermentation and breakdown, you know, the, the microbial home happens, the size of the colon, the length of the colon has shrunk in evolution in humans because we don't need that that big machine to generate you know these absorbable products from from, from fiber from plant-based fiber um that's really interesting but, yeah it's it sort of a this really makes makes a lot of sense why we're in the situation where we are and i, I think there's there's obviously great efforts now on um so you know um will Bulsa, Bulsa, which is book obviously uh, you know yeah. goes in this in, in this direction and it's kind of interesting because when I was in medical school fiber was something that you were thinking about in uh, normalizing your bowel movement frequency you know that that was mm -hmm. that was our thoughts not that long ago that this is the main purpose yeah. of fiber and so in, in the meantime this is completely changed uh, I, I think there's still culture wars going on in this diet field you know that some people uh, adamantly defend their um, when, when you look at these paleo diets or um, 
keto diets. So those are just as extreme because everything that's in these diets is absorbed proximally in the small intestine and does not go, does not feed your your uh, microbes. I could even go, you know, another speculation um, that 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 I came up with is so the microbes have been around for for billions of years. So they're the main dominant life form initially in the oceans, um, and they use that time to for a lot of learning and a, a lot of this information that they learned they stored in their genes. So you have millions of genes compared to our mere 20,000 genes. So a lot of information stored in this. So they are pr pretty much the most intelligent life form, you can say, on, on, on the planet. They will almost <laughs> certainly... <laughs> they, I like they, that. They will, I knew I was smart somewhere. <laughs> just the look in my gut. <laughs> they, will, they will certainly survive any global disasters or climate change. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the microbes that will survive it partly because of that intelligence. So I, I often thought about this idea, why would we wanna, why, why is the diet that is optimized for the microbes the best for for our health and also for planetary health? It, it, it has something to do with that intelligence. You know, you wanna, you wanna feed this most intelligent part in your, uh, that, that exists in the world and that has, these microbes have cousins in, in, in the soil. They have cousins um, everywhere on, 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 on every surface, you know, they're, they're ubiquitous and they, there's even some system that they communicate with each other, you know, the, uh, certainly with the soil, you know, if you grow a healthy plant in a healthy soil, that health is stored in these polyphenols in the plants, which then we eat, you know, and, and, and which are beneficial for they send a, a health message to our gut microbes and, so it's so a very close connection or communication channel between the soil microbes, our, the cousins of our gut microbes, and, and us. So I, I think that's I, super I, interesting. That's a wonderful perspective as well. To <laughs> humbling. See yes. Humbling, yes. but also <laughs> I am smart and uh, we are connected um, around the world. Like it's not when we are destroying one environment um, first for, for a resource, we're not seeing that connection that actually there, we are biologically connected to that environment as well. Yeah, we are, we are. And, you know, it's, it's, it shows you, for example, with these pandemics, you know, um, so these, these pandemics arise in part because a, you know, if, I mean, most of them come from animals is these zoonotic diseases and, um, there's just two two reasons why we see that. One is um, the way industrial uh, farming uh, or, or animal husbandry is, is, you know, incompatible with health of the animals, and the microbes obviously play a big role. There, these animals are exposed to uh, high doses of antibiotics to keep them alive and healthy. And on the other hand, when we're destroying the rainforest in um, in in Southeast Asia or on the Amazon, we're removing a buffer between uh, the wilderness and these wild animals and wild environments uh, and humans. So we get closer and closer. It's almost like the, the set about the barrier that we have in the gut, you know, uh, as long as we separate enough, there's no danger. If you get too close to them, these microbes jump over this, this um, barrier and um, cause these diseases in us. So it, it goes, yeah, you could write just a, a philosophical book about, uh, uh, microbial intelligence i think it's a maybe at some point i'll do that <laughs> <laughs> i look forward to it um so could you tell us a little bit more uh, dr mayer about what happens when we starve our microbiome specifically if then if we have no food making its way to our large intestine for them what happens so you'll you'll see something that we'll see in other ecosystems that the the diversity of this ecosystem will shrink uh, and the richness because uh, you know the uh, I mean the microbes are specialized for particular fiber molecules for particular polyphenols. It's not that one microbe can digest you know all these they're all specialists and um, so if you start them with certain things like fiber different types of fiber these specialists are going out of business. There, there's no need for them. Um, and they will they'll decrease in their relative abundance. 
which we have been seeing, you know, on, on a continuous basis since, uh, since the last 75 years. They go into a stage that they are not uh, detectable with like crude techniques like the 16S um, sequencing that we do to look at, you know, the relative abundances of, 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 of microbes. But, but there, there still may be traces there. So they, they go into the stage of semi-extinction that we also see in many animals in, in, the, you know, in the rainforest. Uh, and at some point they will go extinct and will not come back. Um, so we'll, we'll gradually impoverish, um, we lose a lot of the specialists in, in our microbial system and not just the diversity. So you could say you have a diversity if you have one representative of each microbial strain. But, but that's not really a diverse system. It has to be rich. There has to be enough numbers of each of those. That So if if these numbers go down, the richness goes down, then um, this whole ecosystem will get impoverished um, and will a couple of things will happen. Just like, you know, this, this is another thing that you see at different scales of ecosystems from um, it will become more susceptible to perturbations. Um, so we'll, we'll not have the ability to be resilient or resistant or bounce back. Um, so an insult like um, a course of antibiotics or a um, an gastrointestinal infection will have a much uh, severe effect on, on the gut than in somebody who has a very diverse and, and, and rich ecosystem. And not just on phenomena in, in, in the gut, to send you know um, the communication and with the with the immune system is also impoverished. So, so this, um, this this learning process that uh, teaches the immune cells what's good and bad, uh, differentiate between good and bad, this gets impoverished with um, with, with a declining richness and diversity, and that leads to the immune system making these wrong decisions, you know, attacking our own cells, autoimmune diseases, or um, overreacting to beneficial components in the diet, and that would be the food allergies and, and food sensitivities. So, yeah, the, um, so microbiome science, and not by coincidence, you know, a lot of people that went into this area were um, ecologists. They came from ecology and they can apply and scale what they've learned in natural environments, in, you know, the rainforest directly to same mathematical principles. Okay, interesting. Um, so we touched on the pandemic before you mentioned genetic diseases, etc. It's implied in what you said before, but would uh, improving the health of our microbiome, which improves our immune system, would that help <laughs> us in this pandemic environment? Yeah, so there is, um, I mean, obviously all the science has not come out yet, you know, about the risk factors and the vulnerability factors. Um, but one thing is pretty clear that in the US, for example, and I'm sure it's the same in, in Australia, that populations um, that have a lot of what's called comorbidities, which are essentially diseases that all fall into this category of these non-infectious disease epidemic, the same diseases, uh, so people that have more of these diseases, which I would say have more of this diet-induced compromised microbiome and, uh, you know, Im uh, immune system activation, that they have a significantly higher risk of developing um, COVID-19 infections in general, but particularly more severe courses and um, are more likely to develop this long COVID complication that symptoms don't go away. And... Um, so that's you know that that is pretty clear that a, a healthy diet that um, and that leads to to a greater health, get a greater gut health, and less of these comorbid conditions is protective against these viral infections. The virus itself does not really go through the gut. It's, there's other viruses that do that, but this one goes through the through the pulmonary system. But as we talked about before, you know, the immune system in the lungs are influenced, strongly influenced by the immune cells from the gut. So it's um, it's kind of a long distance effect. Um, and um, 
I, I, I would bet all my money on it that there is a fairly close connection between those. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's other factors in the US, you know, people that are in these vulnerable populations have less access to the healthcare system. Um, you know, there's racial factors that, that they usually, um, it's more likely to be, you know, African American or, or, or Latino populations. Uh, but but I think the main thing is this connection through this chronic disease epidemic that almost all these people, I mean, just if I look at, at TV and I see the patients, you know, most of them are, you can tell it just on TV, are obese and uh, that that end up in the ICU. And uh, and I should always say, I'm, I'm, I'm not, like when I talk about obesity, I'm not talking about the cosmetic aspect of it. That's everybody's own choice, but um, it's the metabolic um associations you know that that's really the dangerous part and you would say potentially those that enter into a, a acute respiratory response like that really inflammatory response that's happening in the lungs you're going back to the beginning of our conversation you would say that that's a there's a metabolic connection there there's something that the immune system that you know which is starting in the gut is being compromised and perhaps someone having a higher you know immune response in their in their lungs would be a potential result of um, gut dysbiosis is that no absolutely and then this you know there's this phenomenon called the uh, cytokine storm that um, investigators or physicians have um, identified on, on on patients who do the worst so this means an exaggerated cytokine inflammatory response which likely you know has its origin at the at the gut level that, that this system is just i mean this is something that you know these these unhealthy interactions of the um of the microbes with the immune system ultimately end up in different patterns of exaggerated immune system responses. So in the in the allergies or in the uh, autoimmune diseases, th these are all exaggerated responses to normal stimuli. Uh, and certainly with the metabolic situation, this uh, metabolic endotoxemia, there's there's no pathogen that triggers that. There's, there's no bad microbe. You know, it's 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 triggered by just by the contact of immune cells with with the good guys in our in our gut. Um, yeah. So this is is most likely the link. This exaggerated immune response that affects manifestations in different organs. Interesting. So you would say one of the the, the biggest casualties, maybe the largest casualties of the pandemic has been our anxiety levels um, that, that's been that's been circulating around but due to media. And so I'd, it would be um, wrong of us not to ask you about that as well with your previous book and the, uh, the Gut Mind Connection. So tell us about that. What's happening during the pandemic with people's anxiety levels and what's the curious gut connection that's happening there? Yeah, so no, no question that this is something that is not as life threatening, you know, the increased anxiety and um, there's been an increase in, um, in overdoses. Uh, so it doesn't just affect the, the anxiety, but also substance abuse of the uh, frequency. I, I don't know about uh, suicides, but it certainly has, a, has had a major effect on, on, on the brain. How much of that is driven by simply this dramatically changed interaction between you know between humans in society the social isolation and the uncertainty and always the fear that some people have more than others to get infected uh, <clears throat> that that's certainly certainly one thing that's easily understandable um, how much of that has actually happened through uh, our, our microbes influencing you know the 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 brain these psychotropic uh, influences that's kind of hard to determine there's certainly we know the pathways that this can happen that um so my explanation for that has always been the anxiety starts at the brain level um because there's there's so much research on that from you know early life on how it's how this is programmed um but then this anxiety um triggers these influences from the brain through the autonomic nervous system onto the gut. The gut is one of the main targets of this, this autonomic nervous system outflow, sympathetic nervous system outflow. And that's, that influence can affect the behavior of the microbes. Um, 
it makes them more um, more aggressive, certainly of any pathogen, um, and it also affects the leakiness of the gut. Um, so that kind of chronic stress has similar bad effects on the gut as the, the poor diet has. And then the end result is, you know, the microbes produce all these um, these, these metabolites, these, these chemicals, neurotropic, you know, that are similar to the neurotransmitters that are in, are in our brain. And some of them by different ways, either through the vagus nerve signaling or through the bloodstream, reach the brain and can, um, can enhance the anxiety response um, and sort of set up this vicious cycle. That's kind of hard to prove um, in, in, in humans because of this circular loop. Um, but it, it almost certainly has to happen because we know all the bits and pieces. We, we just haven't been able to study this um, in, in, an, in a living human being, you know, how this circular uh, communication happens. But we do know for sure living in a pandemic with all the social ramifications which are greater for some people. I mean, I, and then there's the whole political thing around it, the anger, uh, which certainly in this country has played a major role, the combination of the political uncertainty and anger and aggressiveness. Um, that, that all, and you know, I said this in my, in, in my book pretty clearly, this changes the environment for the microbes dramatically in the, in the gut. If you're chronically stressed or angry or anxious person, everything changes at the gut level. The microbial behavior, the, all the gut cells, um, and the, that leads the microbes to produce substances that can affect affect the brain. Wow. Could you tell us a little bit more about how our, our emotions do impact our gut? What's happening? How are they so responsive to it? And exactly what happens? What are they releasing? You know, this started with, with animal studies, um, these sort of germ-free mouse experiments where you, can easily in in a in in a mouse get rid of the normal all the normal microbiome and then um, put microbiome from anxious animals into this gut of a mouse without any, and depending on the emotionality of the donor mouse, that recipient mouse will change its emotional behavior. So those are the experiments that really started this whole fascination of um, you know mi microbial brain in interactions. Um, and as we just talked about, it goes the same way the other way around, that um, any emotion that goes in, in the brain will have a, a mirror image in the gut. Um, we know this, for example, for negative emotions and, and stress, what they do to, um, to the relative abundances of, of, of gut microbes. For, for example, a chronic, in the chronic stress mouse model, um, there's a marked decrease in certain um, bifidobacteria, dr dramatic decrease. It's it's a complicated story. I don't know if, if your listeners, you know, would want to go that far into the into the biochemistry, but these bifidobacteria produce a substance, hydrogen peroxide, that normally um, um, that 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 suppresses other bacteria competitors, but that also affects the conversion of the essential amino acid tryptophan into a um, into a neurotoxic, neuroinflammatory metabolite, kynurinine. And so you have the chronic stress, you get a decrease in population of microbes, you get decreased production of this hydrogen peroxide, which then disinhibits the production of kynurinine from, from tryptophan. And that kynurinine affects the nervous system. So in the mouse, we know pretty much how that works, um, and 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 as I said, we we have the other pathway as well. That um, uh, this has been pretty well studied in in these mouse models. How the signals from um, or the or the metabolites from mice with a particular uh, emotional behavior can can affect the the behavior of a, of a recipient mouse, and that has been partially reproduced in humans. So, you know, investigators have looked at um, uh, fecal microbial transplants from patients with major depressive disorder and put them into these germ-free mice. And then these mice develop depression-like behavior. 
And when they looked at the microbes of these mice that got the, 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 the transplant from, from the depressed patients, they also showed a similar pattern. Uh, um, and then certain metabolites in that, um, that these microbes produce then have been linked to, to these behavioral changes. So there's one metabolite, another tryptophan metabolite um, in doxyl sulfate, for example, that has now been identified uh, as a major risk factor in not only in depression, but also Alzheimer's disease and autism spectrum. So wow. we haven't gotten to the point, and probably never get to the point that we can, we can do these mouse experiments, taking doing fecal microbial transplant from one human to another and inducing depression. It will never be allowed, thank God. Um, but, but we have but we have these experiments, you know, that um, you can do this from humans into a mouse and, and reproduce the equivalent of the human emotional disturbance. Okay, wow, thank you so much. Um, and for our listeners, so you spoke a little bit before about our dietary choices, how it impacts our microbiome. So uh, I guess leaving labels aside, I guess potentially what are some criteria that someone can really go, okay, this is a good meal for me today because it has X, Y, Z. What would be your, your advice there? Yeah, I would say the general rule would be anything that has fiber in it uh, is beneficial. So that, that means pretty much every um, you know, every vegetable, if you have real starchy potatoes that has very little fiber, um, that will not be a good choice. So anything that's starchy and the reason that some of these, um, foods are starchy is because we selected, um, you know, uh, species of these, um, of potatoes, for example, from the sweet potato with a lot of fiber to the, um, French fried potato that is now, you know, one of three types of potatoes that's left in the U.S., for, for example. Um, um, so you want to avoid uh, all the starchy vegetables and ideally fruits, and you want to get uh, those uh, vegetables. Like uh, kale is a good example. Um, you know, broccoli. I mean, there's many vegetables that have very different fiber types. So the, the greater the variety of um, of, of vegetables that you consume and you don't have to worry too much about like a, like a carrot obviously also has a lot of sugar in it, but if you eat that together with the fiber of, of that carrot, uh, the absorption is much slower and the, the effect on, 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 on your, the negative effect on your gut is much, much less. The other categories are, are fruits. Um, so fruits are not the highest in fiber, but in general uh, with some exceptions, but they're high in these polyphenols, these large molecules, um, you know, that, that, that have to have been labeled as, um, antioxidants. And it was found that the bioavailability is extremely low. So if you eat these foods, um, you know, these, these molecules are not almost not detectable in your, in, 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 in your blood. So they require the microbes to break them down and they just like the fiber will increase the diversity and richness and the microbes in exchange will produce all these smaller molecules of phenolic compounds with that have health benefits. And I should step back. So polyphenols, the, the, the reason that plants make these polyphenols, it's their own pharmacy, it's their own medications. They make those to defend themselves against uh, UV light and droughts and uh, pests and insects. And uh, so anything that could harm a plant um, polyphenols are being produced to counteract this and it's it's a beautiful story how if a plant is exposed to one of these influences it sends down alarm signals to the roots to its roots the roots secrete this sugary um, juice that attracts the microbes in the soil and then the microbes stimulate the plant to produce these polyphenols i mean it's sort of an amazing wow. story and then the polyphenols go up in a plant and they're mainly going to the sites that the plant wants to defend, which are the seeds and the fruits and uh, the leaves. Um, so the highest concentration of these polyphenols are in, are in the seeds. Um, and so you want to have a, a diet that's rich in all the nuts and seeds, um, even though they have, you know, often a high fat content, 
but it's plant-based fat in general, so it does not have the negative health consequences. Um, so that's kind of third. So you have the fiber, you have the the actual fruit, and you have the seeds and nuts. Um, and, and then from processed foods, you want to focus really on on the fiber content of these processed foods. So bread is a good example. Uh, you know, if it's made from ancient grains uh, and has a high fiber content, uh, there's nothing wrong with that bread. I mean, there's, I don't know about Australia, but in the US it's developed this phobia and demonization of bread in general. I think that's totally wrong. I mean, every time I visit Bavaria, and so they, they're pretty good in having resurrected many of these ancient breads that they make, you know, <clears throat> and if you look at the the fiber content, it's it's very high. So it's actually a health promoting. Um, that's true also for, for example, pasta, you know, you know, so you have a couple of choices. You can go with the whole, um, the whole wheat pasta and the, the Italians, this is what I've learned. Um, so there's a lot more uh, types of, of, of wheats and cereals in, in Italy, I think, I forgot what the number is, like 100 times more variety of these these grains that they make, you know, their, 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 their flour from. And so many of these um, it, Italian produced pastas um, um, have a high fiber content, or you can go to what's now available, and, and we've sort of been really gotten used to these these plant-based pastas made out of peas and um, um, beans, different types of beans, which you know, which tastes a little bit different from from the regular Italian pasta, but it's still. So you know, if you eat a lasagna, you don't have a have to have a bad conscience of having consumed, uh, you know, a whole bunch of carbs that are rapidly absorbed. So they. You, you get this fiber content uh, of, of 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 your beans and 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 peas that are in there. And uh, thank you so much um, for everything that you've shared. I think um, thank you for persisting for twenty years before this was mainstream. Well, Thirty five, isn't well, it? I mean, before what? like in oh, the, before in, it in started time, to catch on. Before it started yeah. to catch on, because I really feel that your work has such an important role to play um, for where we are at now, obviously, and our future. Um, as a species and how we see the world. So it's really incredible work that you've done and we really appreciate the time that you've um, so generously shared with yeah. us on this podcast. So um, you've got a book that's coming out. Um, tell us a little bit about that. And also it would be, would be remiss not to talk about the um, previous book that you have, which is amazing, which is what we originally got you to speak on our series for. Yeah, so you know you can see the original book in the background and its various translations. The reason it's all it's all the first book because I took this picture in my office um, and have not gone back to exchange it. Um, so, <laughs> so this is this is the new book that got uh, the immune connection. The gut. Awesome. If you're listening on audio, that's the gut immune connection. And when is and that getting released? It's it's released in um, in two weeks on June eighth. Awesome. And um, in in the US, I I don't know about Australia, but uh, <clears throat> um, yeah. So the first book was really focused on this. Um, I was surprised, you know, I hadn't thought about writing a book, but we published this paper where we showed that uh, ingestion of uh, a probiotic cocktail in healthy young women would affect brain activity uh, on a brain scan, and that received so much attention by the media that I got several phone calls by uh, agents and uh, publishing houses that wanted to, me to write a book about this, which which I did. It was, you know, first time author, made all the mistakes, possible mistakes you can make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Painful process. I'm, I'm surprised that five years later, I've forgotten all the pain and, and you know, coming did up with the second one. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm really thinking about another one, you know, it's, so now that I got the hang of it, of how to do it the most efficiently. And, uh, and I do enjoy the ability now to influence through people like you guys and I have to really congratulate you, what you're yeah. doing, um, you know, to reach a much bigger audience and uh, change behaviors. Um, 
I don't. I no longer need to convince my colleagues about the importance of the brain gut axis. Okay. Um, that's beyond me. Yeah. Uh, that that um, ambition. But now I, I really want to reach you know a, a very large audience with and and changing behavior. So this is really the um, kind of this you know giving back. I mean I had a. I I mean I always feel incredibly um, full of gratitude for for my own life and career. So this is kind of giving back and all the information that I've accumulated, give this back to a wider audience. Yeah, this has been a wonderful experience. I, I think it's, um, it's kind of fulfilling to, that, that this came together in a way the way the way it has, you know. Well, I'm sure it's happened for a, a very special reason. And yeah. um, thank you so much for the work you've done. We've really enjoyed the time that we've had with you today. And we're really looking forward to these now that you've perfected the system. Um, keep pumping out these books. Yeah. <laughs> a... Pump out another, uh, uh, what, 385 like you have on in your published papers? <laughs> There's your challenge. I'm not going to get to this. So, I, I, mean, so. <laughs> I, I mean, the papers have become boring. You know, really, it's, it's, it's still, I, I, I do like to be, so the reasons that papers are coming out, so, you know, we have this Bring Out Microbiome Center. I love to interact with students, I, I think, to... This is sort of another thing, you know, shaping the minds and the career trajectories of, of young people. I mean, it's, um, w which is working, you know, I mean, once they've gone through the, I would almost say brainwashing of medical school that ignores many of these factors, um, you know, like before that, these brilliant students, I mean, this is the, the crop of the crop, you know, the, um, um, are so open, um, and I would also say it's mainly women, female students that are feel attracted to this more holistic view of health and, uh, mm. uh, you know, what we can do for health. So, yeah, this is something um, that still makes me write the scientific papers with the, with the students, you know. <laughs> but otherwise, I think I would totally focus on the book writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very thankful that you're still writing the papers. As we were saying before the call, uh, I wrote... I've been writing some papers on uh, uh, the gut, a uh, brain connection. And uh, as I've been going through PubMed, I've been like, oh, I like this article. Who's it by? Oh, Emerin. And, and oh, I like this article. Who's it by? Oh, Emerin again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> over and over and over. So thank you so much. Thank you for uh, donating your expertise to the wider community and our community today. We so appreciate it. So for all of you listening, you can follow uh, Dr. Emerin on Instagram. He His handle is Emerin. Emerin Mayer, nice and simple. And you can check out his website to get the links to his books, The Gut Brain uh, Connection <laughs> yeah, and The Gut Immune Connection, <laughs> uh, which at the time of the release of this podcast, both of them should be available. So very and cool. Thank you so newsletter. much. Yes, the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> You're becoming quite <laughs> omnipresent, mate, um, Emran. So that's wonderful. We can keep in touch with you everywhere. So thank you again so much. We so appreciate your time, and um, and uh, we we look forward to seeing what you come out with next. Okay, thank you guys. Really appreciate this. You're you're wonderful, and your message is great. So thanks for doing this. Well, that was a show record for a length of interview and <laughs> there was just so much to ask him. So much to ask. We could have spent hours asking him more questions. So we really hope you guys enjoyed the amount of content that we covered as much as we did. Uh, he mm -hmm. is certainly a, um, a sage, you would say, in this yeah. space. Like he is so knowledgeable and obviously his academic record speaks for itself mm -hmm. as to the impact that he's had on this this entire space it really inspired us um his work um mm -hmm. helped pioneer and inspire us for the gut brain series that we created and um it's it's huge and mm -hmm. so we really hope you enjoyed it so let us know in the comments what what did you get out of that particular interview the most um mm -hmm. there's so much we did cover so we'd be really curious to hear from you guys as to what you thought was the most interesting and don't forget to give us a like and a subscribe. Um, we have more exciting interviews coming <laughs> up. So make sure you don't miss out on any of those by staying subscribed and hitting that little notification bell. That means you won't miss out. All right, we'll see you guys soon. See you next week. <laughs>